Good evening. My name is Kelsey Brooke Eckert. I'm a former high school social studies teacher turned professor of social studies education. And I'm Brooke Sullivan. I was raised to believe that men and women <clears throat> are created equal. And within my parents' home, that belief felt true. However, when I went out into the world, whether it be sports or school or even in my corporate job, the inequities were very real. And it puzzled me to understand why so many still existed for men and women today. It forced me to look back, where does this start? And is there something we all missed in our education or our experiences to better understand this belief? If women and men are equal, why aren't they equally visible within our classrooms? How can women become what they cannot see? Representation matters. When people see examples of people like them doing things that they didn't think they could do, it opens doors. When society calls for more women in different areas, as a history teacher, I know that what would make that cultural shift happen is having more examples of women who already navigated those things. And a deeper cultural understanding that women have always been outside of the home. We, how can we be what we cannot see? We need to see more women in history. After years of collegiate history courses taught by all male professors, I realized I don't know women's history. Women are half of humanity. They should be half of the content taught in classrooms. It's basic math. Sick of lamenting the lack of women's history in history classes, Brooke and I founded the Remedial History Project. The Remedial History Project is a nonprofit working to get free women's history into primary and secondary classrooms. In history class, I joined Kelsey in producing a weekly podcast. It comes out about women's history and it comes out every Monday. We blow up topics and we break the former understanding of history to re-educate everyone on the history we missed in our own educations. We also produce free videos and lesson plans that meet current practice on social studies education that a teacher could snag off of our website, www.remedialherstory.com, and implement tomorrow. We recommend books and films and fascinating women that you should learn more about. I start every class I teach with this question. What is the past? When an event happens, do all people agree on how that event played out? History was once current events. How many different perspectives are there on our current events? There could be as many histories as there are human witnesses. When I was in school, if women were mentioned, it was often as some sidebar. Uh, to the historic narrative, pop-up history, and it leaves us with this impression that all women agree um, with one another's perspective in particular. And when history fails to include comprehensive women's history and that of diverse experiences, women neglecting, it really leaves us to believe and that neglected layers of race and class, it leaves us to believe that middle-class women are the norm and middle-class white women are mostly the norm. Valuing diversity and bringing more voices to the table helps society problem solve and better innovate. We cannot solve our current challenges without bringing women's voices to the table. And further, if we want to evolve past the place we are in, we have to understand where we've been. In 1985, a woman named Alison Bechtel wrote a comic strip satirizing how few women appear as major characters and appear to have lives in the movies. The immediate result was something nicknamed the feminist movie test or the Bechdel test. Here it is. A film has to have two women that at some point talk to each other <laughs> about something besides the male characters. That's it. Two women who exist and talk about stuff. <laughs> this test helped raise awareness of gender discrimination due to the lack of women present in positions of power. Quick show of hands. Raise your hand if the majority of teachers you had growing up were women. Okay. This is reflective of the data. 75% of all teachers in the United States are women. And 59% of all secondary educators are women. And so it sometimes surprises people to learn that secondary and collegiate history teachers are uh, that history is not only dominated by the stories and accomplishments of men, but that it's also primarily taught and researched by them. 
58% of high school social studies teachers in the United States are men, and history professors are, are mostly men with 65%. So while most of us had female teachers growing up, it's important to ask, why would men have such a stronghold on history? Men teaching history is not inherently problematic, except that only 6% of male historians write about women. If scholars are not writing about women, it won't trickle down to the teachers. And studies show that teachers discuss women's topics between 5 and 20% of the time, with 5% being the plurality. That is nowhere near half. So we've applied the Bechtel test to the history curriculum, and we call it the Eckert test. I created the Eckert test because I was saddened at how many times I failed to bring a female perspective into my own lessons. The Eckert test is what I do to hold myself accountable to a more comprehensive and diverse women's history. Okay, Kels, but how does it work? The test is this. One, there are two women present in the lesson. Those two women have different opinions, and they represent different backgrounds, whether that be racial, sexual identity, ethnic, religious, generational, or economic. At first, what I did was I started adding women's perspectives to my lessons. I took one that I had on two black men who founded the NAACP but had really, really different perspectives on civil rights tactics. And to that lesson, I added the iconic Ida B. Wells Barnett. She also founded the NAACP, but what I had done was I put Wells Barnett in a position where she had to speak for all black women. There wasn't any women's diversity. Men get to be diverse in history. They get to have disagreements. But women who just pop up into history class don't get that luxury enough. I'm not sure I could name two women from every era, but I could name two men. So I think this is the problem. <laughs> it's definitely challenging, but with research, it is doable in every period and region of the world as far back as you can go. Um, even Mesopotamia? Brooke, even Mesopotamia. <laughs> I can name Kubaba off the top of my head. She was the first monarch in all of world history. Um, and with some Wi-Fi and an hour, I could make this happen. But let's pick a topic that most people in our audience know better, early American history. Okay. The further back people go in history, the more they tend to stereotype women into domesticated housewives. We often hear people oversimplifying women's history and providing cop-out reasons to exclude women from the narrative. Women didn't do much. <laughs> Cute. That's a great point and a perfect example of the way that women's history gets erased. In every region and period of not just the U.S., but world history, women were there, they were documented, and diverse in thought and action. We know some native societies were matrilineal, where they passed power down through female lines, including the Wampanoag, who lived on the land that we are on right now. And while the ideal for women in both native and colonist cultures was to become mothers and serve in domestic capacities, in both cultures, women worked outside the home, taught, earned wages, sued for their freedom, owned land, voted, and participated in the politics of their time. Women were on the Mayflower when it arrived, 17 of them. We know all of their names. Okay, but do we know enough about these early women to have a colorful debate or discussion within a history class? Yes. We know that most of, about most of these women, and, and Native women and white women, through the writings of the men who came with them. So the Mayflower landed in 1620, and one of the biggest questions that should be investigated in a secondary history class is about the interactions between the so-called pilgrims and the Wampanoag when they arrived. And so, it is important to note that in 1675, these two groups were engaged in the bloodiest war in U.S. history. And between 1620 and 1675, a lot changed. Clearly, so much changed, especially for the Wampanoag. They contracted European diseases, and 90% of the tribes were, were eliminated. Mwidamu was the leader of one of the tribes in the Wampanoag Confederacy, and she was also sister-in-law to the great leader. She married many times to form alliances, and when one of her husbands died in English custody, she called foul. Time passes and she remarries, but eventually things between the Wampanoag and the English become too tense, and her sister's husband, Medicom, called Philip by the English, 
goes to war. Widamu's various marriages throughout her life meant that she commanded the allegiance of every major tribe in the Wampanoag Confederacy. Widamu had to decide whether to lead her people to war or to try to negotiate with the English. Her husband sided with the English, but she decided to side with the great leader, Medicom. She dissolved the political marriage and turned those allied with her against the English. But Kelsey, the Eckert test has to have two women present, isn't that correct? Correct. Okay. So this is a great place to bring Mary Rowlandson. She's captured and brought to Witamu during King Philip's War. She was held for 11 weeks and years later published a book about her experience that we can read as a primary account. Current practice in education asks students to become historians themselves with primary sources from the past. So how amazing that we can go this far back and that there are sources not only about women, but by women. Yeah, so cool. Rowlinson and Weetamu are awesome because they are two women who disagreed and represent different backgrounds. Rowlinson complained that Weetamu didn't give her enough to eat. In reality, Weetamu was in charge of a massive war effort in a time of scarcity. Rowlinson was ransomed home. Weetamu died in the conflict. Her decapitated head was brought back as a trophy, and when the imprisoned Wampanoag saw it, they wailed in agony over the death of their leader. Leaders. Clearly, women were not just housewives in either culture, and colonial history is absolutely already being taught in our classrooms. Yet, but to accurately tell the story of what happened in the past, we still have hurdles ahead. Because while these women were there and meet all the hallmarks of what makes history, leaders, wars, etc., the war was named after the man and ignored the coalition effort. Why? Is it because this represents a dark period of US imperialism? Or is there some underlying sexism that forgets her? But even when you remove the compounding layer of race, women continue to be skipped even when they meet all the hallmarks. Perhaps a better case is Mercy Ois Warren. Her name should be a staple in any course on the American Revolution. She wrote play after play, poem after poem that riled up New England leading to the war. She was willing to say independence far before her male contemporaries. She was brazen in her literary assault on the king. Her plays were widely read, and most importantly, she wrote the very first history of the American Revolution, published in 1805. The first history. Jefferson ordered copies for his cabinet. He knew and corresponded with many of the founding fathers. She talked with their wives personally. Warren was a staunch anti-federalist, so Adams, the first federalist president, was an obvious target. She joined the many who accused him of being a monarchist. There was a contentious exchange between the two of them, and after failing to talk her down, Adams issued the final blow to a friend, claiming, History is not the province of the ladies. She engaged in political dialogues with the biggest men of her day, and even she is lost to most people's understanding of the time. She exchanged letters with so many other women, one could easily build a lesson to pass the Eckert test. You can teach history from a women's vantage point at any point in history, even when women were not there. On D-Day, not a single woman was allowed to be part of the Allied invasion because the predicted death toll was so high. This was no place for a lady. <laughs> but even D-Day, I can teach from a woman's perspective. Martha Gellhorn was a journalist who stowed away on a ship because she wasn't allowed to be there, but all the male journalists were going and she was not going to be left behind. Her account of D-Day is raw and wi was widely read in the United States. Marie Louise Osmont was a French woman who witnessed D-Day from her home on the bluffs of Normandy, where German soldiers were billeting at her house. Her daily journal provides a fascinating firsthand account of the impact of the invasion. And of course, it was Eleanor Roosevelt who addressed the nation with her calming words the morning of D-Day. Even when women are intentionally excluded, they were there. But women like those we've mentioned are also unique women. 
They are the women who defied the odds and fell into the themes that typically make history books. The women we've mentioned made history because they misbehaved. So many women in history behaved. They fell into gendered expectations and they served. The formula for what makes history is politics, diplomacy, military, and business of the past, not society and culture, or the so-called women's sphere. Topics like history of child rearing, C-sections, menstruation, illegal abortion, or sexual assault on women are often left out or only further disadvantage us from our ability to build foundational cultural competencies. Brooke, not to mention that most of the topics you just named are deemed too controversial. They are sometimes too mature for younger students and, most importantly, make most male teachers squirm. If men can't talk about the things that impact half the population's very real lives, both in the past and presently, should they really serve as the majority of people who teach our story? Teachers teach what we know, and most teachers are not taught women's history. Huge names and topics are lost in participating educators in practicing educators. The primary cause, women's history is not required to graduate with a history degree. Teachers who took mainstream routes to teacher certification never took women's history. Often women's history is offered as an elective or an independent course. Women's studies, gender studies, what message does that send? That there is history and women's history. And it's not like once you get out into the field, you're gonna get substantive professional development. Social studies and science teachers are the least likely to receive professional development in their area of study. I've seen this data reflected in my own experience. In eight years teaching in public schools, I had exactly zero school-wide PD in any social studies content area. Social studies has the least PD dedicated to it because it is the least important as dictated by standardized testing and funding. History teachers are routinely attacked in the media for and by the public uh, for teaching current scholarship. Just look at the laws popping up around the country related to critical race theory. That is just one current example of the challenges history teachers face today. Women's history is bound to the social studies and the social studies are routinely on the chopping block. We need more history, not less. Jane Goodall once said, it actually doesn't take much to be considered a difficult woman. Perhaps that's why there's so many of us. Are we difficult because in the real world we actually speak up and have ideas and opinions? We speak up at a rate of higher than one in four, like the textbooks suggest. Do they belittle our disagreements as catfights because there aren't enough historic examples of women's arguments and debates to legitimize our differences? Women are not an interest group. They're half of humanity. Women do not agree they are diverse and have been present throughout history. We need to question the history we think we know. We all need to relearn history to include her story. When we hear the story of the past that doesn't include women, we have to literally break our brain and ask ourselves, wait, where are the women? Representation matters. How can we be what we cannot see? We need to see more women, both in history and teaching it. Lastly, we need more people to engage in fixing this problem. We need to get the examples and materials to our current to using current practice, like those that Remedial History Project has to teachers' hands, and it's free. Teachers need to be encouraged to attend trainings and learn how to incorporate women's voices into already packed curricula. To solve today's problems, we need to better understand the history of half of our population. Women's history has to be half. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>